Chapter Four of The Man Who Found Out A Nightmare by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four The estate of the dead man was small and uncomplicated, and Dr. Laidlaw, as sole executor and residuary legatee, had no difficulty in settling it up. A month after the funeral, he was sitting alone in his upstairs library the last sad duties completed, and his mind full of poignant memories and regrets for the loss of a friend he had revered and loved, and to whom his debt was so incalculably great. The last two years, indeed, had been for him terrible. To watch the swift decay of the greatest combination of heart and brain he had ever known, and to realize he was powerless to help, was a source of profound grief to him that would remain to the end of his days. At the same time an insatiable curiosity possessed him. The study of dementia was, of course, outside his special province as a specialist, but he knew enough of it to understand how small a matter might be the actual cause of how great an illusion, and he had been devoured from the very beginning by a ceaseless and increasing anxiety to know what the professor had found in the sands of Chaldea, what these precious tablets of the gods might be, and particularly, for this was the real reason that had sapped the man's sanity and hope, what the inscription was that he had believed to have deciphered thereon. The curious feature of it all to his own mind was that, Whereas his friend had dreamed of finding a message of glorious hope and comfort, he had apparently found, so far as he had found anything intelligible at all, and not invented the whole thing in his dementia, that the secret of the world and the meaning of life and death was of so terrible a nature that it robbed the heart of courage and the soul of hope. What then could be the contents of the little brown parcel the professor had bequeathed to him with his pregnant dying sentences? Actually, his hand was trembling as he turned to the writing table and began slowly to unfasten a small, old-fashioned desk on which the small gilt initials M.E. stood forth as a melancholy memento. He put the key into the lock and half-turned it. Then, suddenly, he stopped and looked about him. Was that a sound at the back of the room? It was just as though someone had laughed, and then tried to smother the laugh with a cough. A slight shiver ran over him as he stood listening. "'This is absurd,' he said aloud. "'Too absurd for belief. That I should be so nervous.' It's the effect of curiosity unduly prolonged. He smiled a little sadly, and his eyes wandered to the blue summer sky and the plane trees swaying in the wind below his window. It's the reaction, he continued, the curiosity of two years to be quenched in a single moment. The nervous tension, of course, must be considerable. He turned back to the brown desk and opened it without further delay. His hand was firm now, and he took out the paper parcel that lay inside without a tremor. It was heavy. A moment later there lay on the table before him a couple of weather-worn plaques of gray stone. They looked like stone, although they felt like metal, on which he saw markings of a curious character that might have been the mere tracings of natural forces through the ages, or, equally well, the half-obliterated hieroglyphics cut upon their surface in past centuries by the more or less untutored hand of a common scribe. He lifted each stone in turn and examined it carefully. It seemed to him that a faint glow of heat passed from the substance into his skin, and he put them down again suddenly, as with a gesture of uneasiness. "'A very clever or a very imaginative man,' he said to himself, "'who could squeeze the secrets of life and death from such broken lines as those?' Then he turned to a yellow envelope lying beside them in the desk, with the single word on the outside in the writing of the professor, the word 
Translation Now, he thought, taking it up with a sudden violence to conceal his nervousness, now for the great solution, now to learn the meaning of the worlds, and why mankind was made, and why discipline is worthwhile, and sacrifice and pain the true law of advancement. There was the shadow of a sneer in his voice, yet something in him shivered at the same time. He held the envelope as though weighing it in his hand, his mind pondering many things. Then curiosity won the day, and he suddenly tore it open with the gesture of an actor who tears open a letter on the stage, knowing there is no real writing inside at all. A page of finely written script in the late scientist's handwriting lay before him. He read it through from beginning to end, missing no word, uttering each syllable distinctly under his breath as he read. The pallor of his face grew ghastly as he neared the end. He began to shake all over as with ague. His breath came heavily in gasps. He still gripped the sheet of paper, however, and deliberately, as by an intense effort of will, read it through a second time, from beginning to end. And this time, as the last syllable dropped from his lips, the whole face of the man flamed with a sudden and terrible anger. His skin became deep, deep red, and he clenched his teeth. With all the strength of his vigorous soul, he was struggling to keep control of himself. For perhaps five minutes he stood there beside the table, without stirring a muscle. He might have been carved out of stone. His eyes were shut, and only the heaving of the chest betrayed the fact that he was a living being. Then, with a strange quietness, he lit a match and applied it to the sheet of paper he held in his hand. The ashes fell slowly about him, piece by piece, and he blew them from the window-sill into the air, his eyes following them as they floated away on the summer wind that breathed so warmly over the world. He turned back slowly into the room. Although his actions and movements were absolutely steady and controlled, it was clear that he was on the edge of violent action. A hurricane might burst upon the still room any moment. His muscles were tense and rigid. Then, suddenly, he whitened, collapsed, and sank backwards into a chair like a tumbled bundle of inert matter. He had fainted. In less than half an hour he recovered consciousness and sat up, as before he made no sound, not a syllable passed his lips. He rose quietly and looked about the room. Then he did a curious thing. Taking a heavy stick from the rack in the corner, he approached the mantelpiece, and with a heavy, shattering blow, he smashed the clock to pieces. The glass fell in shivering atoms. "'Seize your lying voice for ever!' he said in a curiously still, even tone. There is no such thing as time. He took the watch from his pocket, swung it round several times by the long gold chain, smashed it into smithereens against the wall with a single blow, and then walked into his laboratory next door and hung its broken body on the bones of the skeleton in the corner of the room. Let one damned mockery hang upon another, he said, smiling oddly. Delusions, both of you, and cruel as false. He slowly moved back to the front room. He stopped opposite the bookcase, where stood in a row the scriptures of the world, choicely bound and exquisitely printed, the late professor's most treasured possession, and next to them... Several books signed Pilgrim. One by one he took them from the shelf and hurled them through the open window. A devil's dreams, a devil's foolish dreams, he cried with a vicious laugh. Presently he stopped from sheer exhaustion. 
He turned his eyes slowly to the wall opposite, where hung a weird array of eastern swords and daggers, scimitars and spears, the collections of many journeys. He crossed the room and ran his finger along the edge. His mind seemed to waver. No, he muttered presently, not that way. There are easier and better ways than that. He took his hat and passed downstairs into the street. End of section 4